Good afternoon. Okay, so it's my proud privilege uh, to welcome you know, my teacher. Uh, the thing is, like, and I remember how Focal Star introduced Sayyid Manjul Islam recently. Uh, he just said, if you don't know him, it's your, your problem. Right? And he didn't say anything at all. Okay, so I wish I could say something like that, but uh, I don't have the beat of Professor Focal Alam. Uh, Asper Sir, or Asper Hussain, is Vice President of the Global Center of Advanced Studies and GCAS Professor of English, World Literature and interdisciplinary studies. He's a prominent Bangladeshi theorist, critic, poet, translator, and activist. Hussein is also associate professor of liberal studies slash interdisciplinary studies at Grand Valley State University in Michigan. He also taught English and world literature, ethnic studies, American studies, cultural studies at Washington State University, Bowling Green State University, and Oklahoma State University. In Bangladesh, he had worked as a national weekly magazine editor, a member of national level left activist alliance, and as a university professor before he went to the States. He is currently scholar in residence in the Department of English and Humanities at UVA. Asfar Hussain has published in both English and Bengali hundreds of academic, popular, you know, creative pieces, including translations from several non-Western languages. He has written on a wide range of topics in such areas as Third World Marxism, Critical Theory, Cultural Politics, Political Economy, and Theories and Practices of Interdisciplinary. interdisciplinary. He also written on certain aspects of literatures of Asia, Africa, and Latin America, and of, on such figures as Antonio Gramsci, W.E.B. Du Bois, Franz Fanon, Kazi Nazrul Islam, Maulana Hashani, Begum Rokhaya, to mention but a few. The author of the books, The World in Question, Essays in Political Economy and Cultural Politics, published uh, by Shambhuti Publications 2008, and The Politics of Sites, Subject and Scenes, Micro-Narrative and Essays, which is forthcoming, Hussein has edited numerous issues of journals and magazines both in the US and outside it. Asper Hussain is currently working on several books in both English and Bengali, a few of which are tentatively titled Towards the Political Economy of Land, Labor, Language and the Body, Decolonizing Complete Literature, and Marxisms in Asia, Africa and Latin America. Further, his books in Bengali that are currently in press include Shamrajabad or Shamshkritik Rajniti, Potun, Shabdo or Noishabdi Rajniti, and Keramatma? Oh, Keramatnama, sorry. Keramatnama, uh, Keramat's Chronicles. And Jinna Bhashe Abhusheshe, so science flow and past. So today's talk is co-sponsored uh, co by GCAS also. So without further ado, so let's have a round of applause for our plenary speaker, Dr. Asfar Thanks, Shamsad, uh, for the introduction. And I also want to take this opportunity to thank the Department of English and Humanities on behalf of Preston C. Davis, who is the director of the Global Center for Advanced Studies based in Michigan, for letting them co-sponsor this plenary address today. And thank you all for being here this afternoon. Damn, this fucking piece of paper fucking talks. Please don't get me wrong. That F word just uttered is not mine. And please forgive me if it ends up hurting anyone's sense of linguistic hygiene here. But the F word comes from a character that appears in a story called Money by the Russian writer Sylvan Bemba. And that statement about the piece of paper constitutes an epigraph to my talk this afternoon. And another epigraph, I have another epigraph, which is from Marx, and I quote, this objects, 
gold and silver, just as they come out of the bowels of the earth, are forthwith the direct incarnation of human labor, hence the magic of money." Unquote. So the title of my talk is now Money, Magic and Marks. The order has slightly changed since I submitted my abstract. In fact, things are still changing and ideas are evolving. What can I do? And I must begin by confessing that what I'm going to share with you this afternoon is a work which is not really in a state of being, but in a process of becoming, to use a bit of Hegelian Marxist language here. And I think the, a subtitle of this talk could have more what might be called the M words, say, metaphors, myths, mysticism, metaphysics, mathematics, media, and markets as they are variously, if not always, unproblematically interconnected under the magical power of money to slightly stretch Marx's own words here, the magical power of money that Marx tries to demystify and grasp in his critique of political economy to account for the ways in which capitalism as a historically produced global system obtains and operates. I can help saying that my area is pretty vast and even complex, but owing to time constraints, I'm going to share with you only a few aspects of my ongoing work, rather my work in progress. I should also point out that I will not be able to traverse the entire range of issues, even militantly relevant as they are, to the Marxian critique of political economy as such. Indeed, given the staggeringly voluminous work Marx has produced, the question is always this, which Marx are we talking about? And I intend to focus on certain aspects of the early Marx, the relatively early Marx, with sporadic references to the late Marx, but particularly Marx's vibrantly Shakespearean piece called The Power of Money in Bourgeois Society. Read The Magic of Money in Bourgeois Society to the extent that magic can be taken as power. Magic is power. Knowledge is power, as the cliche goes. Money is power. So what are the, what are the interconnections there? Of course, there are all kinds of meanings and uses of magic, given which we have, for instance, the mechanics, aesthetics, semiotics, philosophy, poetics, and even politics of magic, including magic as praxis, stuff that our conference is still exploring. But I am concerned, but, but I am concerned with the political economy of magic, as mediated partly in Shakespeare and in the early literary, within quotation marks, the literary marks, although of course my talk is mainly, is not mainly about either Shakespeare's work or Marx's work, but about magic and money, rather the magic of money. Here, I use magic in a particular sense, that is magic as transformative, yet mystifying system, among other things, a system that morphs money into magic, that makes a mere piece of paper even talk and even command. The singer Bob Dylan would even say in a lyric, money swears. I quote again, money swears. Or for that matter, money screams, commands, controls, unites, divides, creates, destroys, reveals, conceals. That's the nature of money. And thus, money produces all kinds of contraries and even making them meet and mate. Money even makes one's mouth kiss one's ass. To use Marx's own Shakespeare-inflected in scatological image. In other words, money morphs the apparently impossible into the possible. It is this meaning of magic 
that I emphasize in my talk. Although by no means do I claim that this is the only meaning of magic. Let me now move on to the second section of my talk, which is titled Mao and Microsoft. So Mao Zedong and Microsoft seem to sound alike in the era of late monopoly capital. Let us recall then Mao's urgent question, going where, posed in his poem, and Microsoft's slogan, where do you want to go today? On a different register, in a sardonic and satirical move, the Indian writer and activist Orundhati Roy symptomatically captures what might be called a Mao Microsoft pairing syndrome in the god of small things. And I quote, so there it was then, history and literature enlisted by commerce, curbs, and Karl Marx joining palms to greet the rich guests as they stepped off the boat. Unquote. The juxtapositions of Mao and Microsoft or of Kurtz and Karl Marx and other such juxtapositions such as Che and Chiruts or Marley and Marijuana are not merely a matter of alliteration but are also highly short-circuited fusions and violent mediations made possible by the very logic of capital, or for that matter, the magic of money. Indeed, more than a century and a half ago, Karl Marx could foresee the intensity and energy, the energia and alarm of such fusions and mediations, or discordia concords, if you will, brought about by the magical power of money. By the way, I just use this term discordia concourse and let me explain this very quickly. This discordia concourse, to put it briefly, is a rhetorical device in which opposites are just opposed so that the contrast between them is really striking. In fact, Dr. Johnson, in his Lives of the Poets, defined discordia concourse as, I quote, a combination of dissimilar images or discovery of occult resemblances in things apparently unlike." Unquote. Now, in economic and philosophical manuscripts of 1844, particularly in this chapter called The Power of Money in Bourgeois Society, Marx quotes from Shakespeare's play, The Diamond of Athens, to make certain points about the magic and miracle of mediation and fusion brought about by the godlike power of money. And I quote Shakespeare here. Thou visible God, that soldierest close impossibilities and mayest them kiss, thou speakest with every tongue to every purpose, O oh, thou touch of hearts. There was Shakespeare. And mark this, Shakespeare here describes money as a visible God, as Marx himself puts it with a remarkable, with a remarkable harmonic zeal, I quote, money is the visible divinity, the transformation of all human and natural properties into their contraries, the universal confounding and overturning of things, unquote. This reminds me of the Italian philosopher, Giorgio Agamben, Giorgio Agamben's retort, rather recent retort, to the German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche's famous pronouncement, God is dead. But as Agamben put it in a rel relatively recent interview, I quote Agamben here, no, no, God didn't die. He was transformed into money, unquote. But what does this money transformed into God do? What does money do? Magic. Ars magica. Like ars poetica, like ars erotica, like ars theoria, and so on. As Marx as Shakespeare himself suggests, money, like God, I quote again, soldierist close impossibilities and maced them kiss, unquote. Meaning, in the first place, that the godlike power of money or for that matter, the magical power of money resides in turning the impossible 
into the possible and even and in even making the contraries kiss each other. To quote Shakespeare for them, gold, yellow, glittering, precious gold. No gods. I'm no idle votarist. Does much of this will make black, white, foul, fair, wrong, right, base, noble, coward, valiant. Why this will lug your priests and servants from your sides, block stout men's pillows from below their heads. This yellow slave will knit and break religions, bless the accursed, make the whore leprosy adore. Place thieves, place thieves and give them titles, knee and approbation with senators on the bench. That was Shakespeare. But Shakespeare, Shakespeare further moves in the direction of suggesting how the dominant economic system itself sexualizes or eroticizes money. Later, I will take up the question of the erotic value of money, I quote, money is fucking sexy, unquote, as Madonna would say, or once said, without probably reading Marx or Shakespeare. <laughs> but let me, let, me, let me quickly take up another significant point Marx's, Marx's Shakespeare makes in the lines I quoted earlier, that money, I quote Shakespeare again, speakest with every tongue. Unquote. That is to say, a piece of paper or a physical object talks. And I should point out here that uh, during Marx's times, it was not really a piece of paper. It was gold or silver. It is a physical object. But Marx uses money retrospectively to describe the function of the gold and silver. In fact, the function of gold and silver can easily be equated with the function of money in today's world. So he uses the word money. Shakespeare doesn't directly use the word money in his play or elsewhere. So I just wanted you to keep that in mind. So a piece of paper or a physical object, object talks, a point, if you recall, I made by invoking Sylvan Bemba's character at the beginning. But as Marx's Shakespeare further suggests, money does not merely talk, but talks with every tongue. That's the point. In other words, as the 17th century English playwright Afra Penn already put it, I quote, money speaks sense in a language that all nations understand, unquote. In fact, by bringing Shakespeare, Penn, and Marx together, one might see a similarity between money and language on the one hand, and on the other, a similarity between the very language of money and the language of even music, in that the language in question is universal in both cases. A point, a point that I intend to elaborate on later. But the Shakespearean Marxist point that even that the magical power of money resides in, among other things of course, yoking together, even weird, apparently irreconcilable, contraries and opposites is variously borne out by the phenomenon of what has already come to be known as globalization. We know globalization is now a buzzword. In fact, a whole host of philosophers and political economists from the Latin American philosopher Henry Dussel to the Egyptian political economist Samir Amin to the British political economist David Harvey, among others, already reckoned globalization as a euphemism for the latest stage of capitalist expansion, that is the expansion of finance capital, or say money in its historically specific form, which renders Marx's famous circuits of both M-C-M' and M-M' more relevant and even more magical than ever before. Now let me explain very quickly this to general circuits of capital that Marx provides in his major work, in his magnum opus, Das Kapital, or Capital. Now in this circuit, M-C-M prime, M stands for money, and C for commodities. In fact, the buying and selling, the cycle of buying and selling of commodities. 
and M prime stands for more money. The suggestion here is this, that here money brings more money. Money begets money. More money, money and money and money and money. So that's magical according to Marx. And that becomes magical under a particularly historically specific condition. And that condition can be called capitalism itself, as Marx suggests. Money and money, MC and prime, this particular circuit, I can just resist the temptation of telling you that, has been tried very surprisingly by a Bengali writer, Jivananda Dash. He has a short story called Katha, 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 Katha. It's repeated. And in that very short story, in fact, translates very creatively Marx's M, C, C M, particularly M dash M prime into his own idiom, which is very interesting. M, M dash M prime. There's another circuit where money directly brings, brings money. The earlier circuit, M dash C dash M prime, involves the buying and selling of commodities. All right? The second circuit, which is M dash M prime, does not involve that cycle of buying and selling commodities, but you know, it makes money bring money directly. Money be getting money directly. So that's finance capital, actually. To put it very simply, of course, I'm obviously, I'm obviously simplifying a lot here. Now, in order to see what so-called globalization comes to mean magically, I need to move on to the third section of my talk, which is titled Gandhi's Shaven Head, or Head Shaven, and Malcolm X Tattoo. We'll come to terms, we'll come to terms with what's about globalization, imagistic, in terms of images, and see magic. So what is globalization then, both magically speaking and imagistically speaking? Globalization. Christmas and the Communist Manifesto and Gandhi shaven head and Mao's cap and Malcolm X tattooed on white skin and even the tsunami disaster are all commodities and globalization an American tourist I quote hangs around in a pub in New Delhi that serves Lebanese cuisine to the music of a Filipino band in rooms decorated with barrel of Irish stout a stuffed hippo head and a vintage poster announcing the grand old Opry concert to be given in a high school in Douglas, you know, Georgia. Unquote. A multicultural globalist moment that National Geographic has already celebrated with full force. And globalization. An English professor. An English professor blends a spicy textual sli slice from Toni Morrison. Fruit from Rovindran Tagore, fish from Rigobertha Menchu, and vinegar from Trotsky to prepare an exotic and even eclectic chutney for the students who emphasize the need for dealing with sexy, not stale, topics in order to make study fun. As Teddy Eagleton already indicated on somewhat different registers in his book called After Theory. And globalization. My favorite Mexican political cartoonist, El Fisco, tells us what it is in just one sentence. And it's a long sentence, bear with me. A globalization cannot but command, under certain circumstances, long sentences instead of short ones. But on the other one, globalization can abbreviate every goddamn thing that you can possibly think of. Globalization, again, binds contraries, brings together contraries and Globalization itself makes what Shakespeare called contraries meet and even mate. So that's the point. So El Fisco on globalization. I quote, free trade globalization has produced some exceedingly strange phenomena. China, the last socialist, socialist within quotation marks, the last socialist power is glad to provide slave labor to multinationals. A farm in India fills the tax form of an American corporation that produces vodka in Peru and then sells it to a Polish immigrant who are constructing a British 
financed building in Madrid, an enterprise, an enterprise which specializes in biotechnology, tries to copyright the DNA of an isolated tribe from the Amazon, and George W. Bush has become the worst Mexican president ever." Unquote. Mark this then. The image is here. The image is here not only underlying discordia concords and a certain kind of violence resulting from that discordia concords, but they also underline magic as both connective and transformative power, which is the power of money itself, and by extension, the magic of the globalizing logic of capitalism. In fact, under capitalism, logic morphs into magic, and magic morphs into logic continuously. And of course, one can speak of the magic of technology. Professor Shubhidhar, in his keynote address yesterday, if you recall, rightly accentuated it. Rightly. But I argue, but I argue that one cannot understand or account for this magic of technology, or say the magic of globalization itself, without understanding how capitalism as a global system functions and how it variously influences, informs, inflects the practice of everyday life. That being said, let me now turn to the last section of my talk, which again takes up the question of the relationship between money and language. This section is titled, Money Like Language and Vodka Can Do Crazy Things. You know, let me tell you this, actually, I always quote this particular statement made by a character in my favorite short story writer, Russian short story writer, Anton Chekhov's story. What is that statement? Money, like a vodka, can do crazy things. But I also sometimes say that money, more than vodka, can do crazy things. And that's the magic of money. Money outstrips vodka in all sorts of ways. Vodka can go so far. Have you tried vodka? <laughs> it can go so far, right? Eh? Only if you sponsor Yes. I will for you, Shamsar. Get ready. I want to see how far Shamsar can go, which is damn vodka. So, in addition to today's transnational corporations and the global explosions of their advertisements, the works of William Shakespeare and Karl Marx keep teaching us a great deal about the relationship between money and language, a point I want to bring back here. And indeed, it is by no means surprising that Marx is a Shakespeare freak. You know, let me tell you this frankly, in our country, actually, Marx has been vulgarized in all sorts of ways. People say, well, Marx is dated, Marx is out of fashion, Marx is an economic determinist, and Marx couldn't foresee what's happening today, and so on and so forth. And Terry Edelton, relatively recently, has done a brilliant job of disputing of exploding certain myths and stereotypes surrounding Marx, not only in Bangladesh, as if I thought he was also at Bangladesh in mind, but in the world. And the book is called Why Marx Was Right. I urge you to read the book. Uh, particularly, I will urge those who have questions about Marx's work to read this book. I should also add that Marx produced, as I've already maintained, as I've already said, produced a great deal of you know, great deal of work. His range is staggering. His works are collected in volumes. So, you know, before we dismiss Marx, we need to read at least his major works. Major works he has produced Marx. And I talked to some Marxists in our country, and to my utter surprise, found that even those Marxists didn't read Marx well. Particularly Marx's magnum opus, Capital, in three volumes. I had to spend several, as I had known, spent you know, more than a decade reading in between, reading Capital, because I thought if I don't read Capital and don't come to terms with it, then I don't get the hang of, you know, Marx's work. But there's another way of doing it. If one reads the Communist Manifesto, which is, you know, the same volume, one can certainly get the basics of Marxism, what you call Marxism, the basics of Marxism. And to my utter surprise, I found that those who are dismissive Deeply and gruffly, deeply and gruffly dismissive, dismissive of Marx, you know, haven't read closely that very text. 
that very book, pamphlet or manifesto, the communist manifesto. So there is no alternative to reading closely uh, a thinker, a philosopher, a writer, if you want to really advance uh, a genuine engaged critique. There's a difference between dismissal, which Marx himself in one of his letters said is a bourgeois disease. Dismissal. We act like that, you I'm not going to do it. We do it. We do it. This dismissal is easy. It's a bourgeois disease. But a critically engaged critique, if you will, is relatively difficult because it calls for work. So, in that spirit, oh, my last section. Although I have to skip some point to time process. When are going to end, Shamsa? Okay. This one, three. Okay. I can go on and on, but I don't want to do this because, you know, after all is said and done, despite the magic of money, money itself cannot feed you. I mean, you need the actual object you've got to eat. And shop the kind of pet for it. It's a Shop the pet for it. Shop the moon for it. Get the pet for it. In addition to today, so let me continue. In addition to today's transnational corporations, as I've already pointed out, and also their advertisements, of course, Marx himself and Shakespeare, together with Marx, I would say, uh, keep teaching us a lot about that relationship between language and money. And as I've said, it's not surprising. It's not surprising that Marx was a Shakespeare freak. I think I would do well to make a couple of points concerning Marx's love for Shakespeare. True, Marx developed his love for Shakespeare relatively early in his life, early on in his life, but it was particularly, it was particularly during his exile in England that Marx passionately devoted himself to Shakespeare. In fact, Marx read Shakespeare every day as Franz Megrin in his biography tells us, I quote, after Marx had become permanently domiciled in London, English literature took first place and the tremendous figure of Shakespeare dominated his field. In fact, the whole family practiced what amounted practically to a Shakespearean cult, unquote. So Marx does not merely quote Shakespeare at whatever chance he gets, but he is the one who suggests that Shakespeare has an acute sense of political economy. That, to quote Marx directly, and I quote, Shakespeare excellently depicts the nature, real nature of money, unquote. And that Shakespeare effectively and instructively dramatizes an interplay between money and language, between the economic and the linguistic. I've already mentioned that the, in the piece called The Power of Money in Bourgeois Society, Marx enthusiastically quotes from Shakespeare's play The Diamond of Athens to make points about the godlike, or for that matter, the magical power of money, which is also the power of language itself. Another, here, let me make a quick parenthetical remark. This piece, The Power of Money <coughs> in Bourgeois Society, has hitherto remain, remained relatively unheeded. Even works such as Marxist Shakespeare's, published in 2001 and edited by Jean E. Howard and Scott Cutler Churchill, and Shakespeare and Marx, another book, book by Gabriel Egan, have remained totally silent about the piece in question. While the book called Money and Magic by Hans Christoph Bins Wagner also does the same. That being said, let me now turn to the question of language, in particular the language of money without which money cannot acquire its magical quality. Indeed, more clearly than ever before, capitalism today as a mode of production, as a mode of economic production to be specific, continuously evolves and enacts its own tongue its own suitable mode of linguistic production while also tending to globalize and even universalize it by turning money into the most powerful, attractive, magnetic, magical, and even erotic language 
one suggesting thereby that to have money is to have this real language, the language of power and the language of beauty and the language of sensual gratification all at once. In the chapter already mentioned, the chapter titled The Power of Money in Bourgeois Society, a chapter that to me reads like a principle, really, Marx sharply underlines the language-like quality of money and the money-like quality of language, while also indicating the erotic nature, the erotic nature, call it erotic value, of money itself. Indeed, what is it? <coughs> what is it that... <coughs> can I have a bit of water? What is it that systematically juxtaposes the female body and hard cash? And mark this, one of those Miss Universes Stefania Fernandez from Venezuela already offered us a strong image of her body wrapped in nothing but cash and cash and cash, rendering visually concrete the very point that money is not merely corporeal but also sexy. And indeed, what is it that transforms the female body into an eroticized yet commodified language that's language on sale from the striptease to the mainstream media to the international body industry? The answer is, and to put it bluntly, the stubborn logic of capital itself without which the magic of money cannot be understood. I should also point out here that capitalism is really, really stubborn on the one hand and is extremely flexible on the other. Dialectically speaking, capitalism is a marvelous system in the sense that it dialectically brings together, it dialectically enacts fixity and flexibility, continuously enacts this interplay between fixity and flexibility. You remain flexible to the extent that you can so that you can acquire money. And you remain stubborn to the extent that you can, so that you can get money. Money, 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 cash, cash, cash. It's true. In fact, the magic of money, as Marx himself uses those words, as I already said, the magic of money. The magic of money, to which the excess of humanity is absolutely asymmetrical, is a matter of appearance, made possible by the reality of capitalism that dialectically produces the magical abundance of money on the one hand and magicless absence of money on the other. I'm echoing and twisting our Poet Shukanta Bhattacharya here, Kudhar Rajya Prithivi Gottamai Purnimar Chant Jana Chalshana Ruti. Right? So, magic is not very magical. That's not a magical moment. But that magical moment is a product also. Interestingly enough, and here is the trick of the magic of money made possible by the system called capitalism. That's the point I'm trying to make. The magical abundance of money on the one hand and the magical absence of money on the other. In other words, you have here the abundance, absence, dialectic. The abundance, let me repeat this point, the point being an important one, the abundance, absence, dialectic. Or to put it even more simply and even bluntly, prosperity and poverty. More than a, more than a matter of magical alliteration, they alliterate prosperity and poverty are causally connected to one another under capitalism. Indeed, from the perspective of capital, if language itself doesn't have an exchange value in the strict political economic sense of the term, language ceases to be language as such. Similarly, from the perspective of capital, if magic does not have an exchange value, magic ceases to be magic as such. But in the process of producing and reproducing what might be called capitalism's magical money language or language money, 
that is language as an exchange value, capitalism also tends to homogenize, appropriate, destroy, and sometimes even flexibly accommodate spaces for different kinds of languages, including oppositional or troublemaking ones. The Russian philosopher of language, V. N. Volosinov, justly asserts, and I quote, I quote from his book called The Marxist Philosophy of Language. Quite a book, it's very relevant. And today, new research, in fact, in the area of the philosophy of language is again drawing on that particular book by the Russian linguist and philosopher Volosinov. Again, the title of the book is The Marxist Philosophy of Language. In fact, Jean-Jacques Lesarto has relatively recently written another book with, with a similar title, and he does an excellent job of reappropriating, reclaiming, and recuperating some of the basic formulations of the end, Wallacino. So here is Wallacino. I quote, the ruling class strives to impart a supra-class, eternal character to the ideological sign to extinguish or drive inward the struggle between social value judgments, judgments which occur in it, to make the sign uni-accentual, unquote. Money uni-accentualizes. So does the language of money and by extension the language of capitalism. This phenomenon may be taken as a fundamental tendency of a capitalist mode of linguistic production. I'm not just talking about the capitalist mode of production only. I'm now talking about this capitalist mode of linguistic production. Yet another fundamental tendency underlying and even governing this mode of production is to standardize and institutionalize a language in ways in which language cannot be equally accessed or owned by the users of language in a given community. That happens too. We need critical thinking here, right? Let's press critical thinking into the service of, you know, our understanding of the ways in which uh, today's world functions. And I think that one cannot understand the kind of world we live in, and for that matter, the kind of country we live in, if we do not understand how the macrologics and micrologics of capitalism as a system continue to influence and inflect the practice of everyday life, a point that I already made on a different register, in a different context. Very important, this understanding. And I also argue that any militant epistemology, by militant I'm not speaking of the military here, by the way, and any engaged epistemology, cannot but pay attention, to put it mildly, to at least four structures or systems of oppression and domination, four structures and systems of power relations, rather unequal power relations and unequal production relations, such as capitalism, colonialism slash imperialism, racism, and patriarchy, profoundly interconnected as they are. How do I know, I'm as far as in what ways, if I do not know where my glasses are coming from, if I do not know where my shirt is coming from, if I do not know where my watch is coming from, they haven't fallen from the sky simply, they're produced and they're the products of labor. A point that Kazi Nuzul Islam in fact made in his great poem called Kuli Moju, a poem that I had the opportunity of discussing just a few days back on television. One of the fantastic poems by Kazi Nuzul Islam is this Kuli Moju. Of course, there is no denying the fact that Kazi Nuzul Islam was in favor of equality, equality and, and mark this, the three announced principles of our liberation war, our national liberation movement included number one, equality, number two, justice, and number three, human dignity. This is three principles and I get this impression that Nuzul not only just anticipated those three principles in the interest of the emancipation of India from British colonial rule but also internalized them to the point that he could rather poetically illustrate those three principles in his oeuvre. Fascinating. And why am I talking about Nuzul here? because I'm going to talk about a little bit about oppositional language. 
money, magic, and magiclessness, the contradictions between the two, and also the language of money, and the language of those who don't have money, and the class struggle, the question of class struggle. I'll bring it up soon. So that's why I just talked a little bit about Nozrul here. I thought it was not irrelevant. So, both language and magic, the language of magic and the magic of language, right? The language of magic. And let me tell you a story. In fact, when I was a kid, I was in, say, you know, student of, when I was a student of class six, my uncle was a college student. And we were in Horikpur. So I discovered a book on his table. And the book is called Ashul Solemani Jadu. And I got interested in magic. What is it? This is a damn book it's all about. I tried to read, but couldn't understand any goddamn thing. So I talked to my uncle, and my uncle said, Oh, you have violated something, you shouldn't have read this thing, this is very dangerous, and this is very this and that. He went on and on, talking about the danger of learning this magic. But I didn't give up. And I kept whining. So one morning he was a little annoyed. And he told me, okay, Aswar, one tip. Do you want to become invisible? I said, sure, I would love that. If I can become invisible, I can access, I can go to all these uh, shops and can have sweets without buying them. <laughs> that immediately occurred to me. So, I'm sure. So there is this thing called Suleimani cap. And if you wear this cap, you will be invisible. You will disappear. Nobody can see you, but you can see everybody. I'm so damn. What a fantastic. Oh, that would be wonderful. Then he asked me to do certain things, step by step. Shoshare Italy, I totally lost interest in the damn magic at that point. But I got interested in other kinds of magic. Of course, the magic of language. I write poetry myself. I write in two languages and translate from several. I always enjoy this magic of language. And this is what our conference is about, among other things, right? The magic of language, how language is creative, and language can transform, and how language can produce. You know, by using language, you can make people cry. By using language, you can make people laugh. By using language, you can bore the hell out of people. By using language, you can do those things. And that means that language has this magical power, is creative, and language, for that matter, is political as well. Why? Why am I talking about politics of language here? Because language is powerful. It exerts power, it asserts power, it occupies power, it makes one lose power under certain circumstances and so on and so forth. And where there is power, there is politics. And hence, the politics of language. And I'm concerned with the politics of language here, among other things, in my talk. So let me get back to the question. The questions of both language and magic, the language of magic, and the magic of language, a political question. And both the language of magic and the magic of language become a site of class struggle, which is fundamentally political, not economic. Not just economic. Marx made that point relatively repeatedly, I would say, that class struggle is a fundamentally political struggle. Struggle over power. And political economy, by the way, before I make another point, I think I would do well to say a few words about political economy, because I have used those two words, that term political economy already, more than once. So what is political economy? Political economy is neither mainstream economics, nor is it mainstream political science. It is an interdisciplinary area of investigation and inquiry. And political economy is not about, and I'm speaking of Marxian political economy, is not about economic determinism either. Because political economy, being dialectical, in fact combats any form of determinism, combats historical determinism and economic determinism. And there are those tendencies in our country, I've noticed, to conflate Marxian political economy with some kind of economics that is determinist. No, no. 
So what is political economy then? To put it very simply, political economy examines the logics, the logics of production, exchange, consumption and distribution. These four categories are the fundamental categories of Marxian political economy. One cannot talk about Marxian political economy without engaging these four categories in their interconnectedness. Now, the question again is, well, consumption uh, and, you know, these four categories, production, exchange, consumption, and distribution. Of what? Only commodities? Hell no. Anything, of anything. Language is produced, exchanged, consumed. Distributed magic is produced. Magic doesn't simply fall from the sky. It involves rituals. It involves action, and so on and so forth. The magic is produced. Magic is also consumed, and so on and so forth. One can talk about the political economy of magic. Does right? Age of magic. It is a big deal. Call it. The peshaw. Right? Then peshaw. Our Shaito. She has seen it. The magician. Nijeraiyo was sitting there. She peshaw. She was money. Bond. Bond. There. Bond. She thought. I can never show you the card. जदुगढ़ स्टैंडिंग and there's of course there are conflicts between those who say who who use say so called polished and correct language and who those who do not between those who have access to the means of the production of the magic of money and those who do not again the question to put it very simply the question of haves and have nots the question of haves and have nots becomes very important something that we cannot afford to lose sight of as far as i am concerned but the history of capitalism but the history of capitalism itself continues to tell us that capitalism not only devalues and destroys but also dialectically generates its opposites its dialectically generates its other thus in a world under capitalism on the one hand we encounter the production exchange distribution and consumption of such languages as nike's slogan just do it and on the other we see the production and exchange of languages like this outcry of the other so to speak as in a remarkably explosive poem by the south korean socialist shaman kim ji ha let me repeat this name check him out kim ji ha is described is usually considered the socialist shaman shamsad is going to present something extremely interesting about the shaman you have already presented or what you didn't i'm still waiting for your order okay <laughs> so get king ji ha the south korean poet mobilizes in the very language of the body a kind of mass rage against the magic of money and let let us hear in my tongue of course in my rendition if you want to call it rendition in my recitation is called speak speak and this reminds me of a poem that the great urdu poet hoy zamrat hoy wrote is called speak speak this brief hour is enough i translated it i myself translated hoy zamrat hoy into english and if you are interested you can check it out it's available rather abundantly online <laughs> it has been anthologized so and i see certain similarities between kim ji ha and for example twice particularly in the context of this poem i'm going to read or share with you speak speak with torn body every wound as an open lip as an open tongue 
I could devour animals by the hundreds, thousands, hard ones. I want to eat pork, put away fat ones. I will eat you. I have been driven mad by long starvation. I will eat even human flesh. I am so unbearably hungry, I can eat money. There was Kim Chihar. Indeed, the lines I've just read may be taken as an example of the oppositional mode of linguistic production. The mode that makes the point that language, like money, is a medium of exchange, all right. But that language can also be at least threatening to the very system that produces money, not of course as the self-causing cause to use Spinoza's famous definition of God, but as a language infecting and language infecting material force. Let me return to Shakespeare. So how did Shakespeare respond to the power of what might be called merchant capital, the very historically specific form of capital that dominated his time and his world in the 16th and 17th centuries? Of course, it would be too quick and even simplistic to suggest that Shakespeare was just out and out, an anti-capitalist playwright. But one finds some suggestive moments of subversion in his work. When, for instance, Shakespeare ends up giving a certain kind of oppositional language to King Lear, who in Act 4 of King Lear at least momentarily rages against the machine, against our machine, a system predicated on the logic of accumulation and profit, a system predicated on the presence and absence of magic. And I quote King Lear, I quote Shakespeare, this is King Lear, let this superfluous and last dighted man that slaves your ordinance, that does not see, because he does not feel, feel your power quickly. So distribution should undo excess and each one, each one have enough. Each one, not this, this is each one. Marx also speaks of this, each one. Indeed, I'm towards the end. Indeed, when distribution undoes itself, and when each, when each has enough, the very capitalist magic of money dissolves. And the real magic of human exchange appears. Indeed, indeed, this is my last statement, although I will close my talk with a poem, a short poem, a one minute long, two minute long poem, you know. And this is my last point, indeed, being human remains an unfinished project today. So let me now close my talk with a poem. I hope I have brought it here. Yes, I haven't been able to memorize it despite my repeated recitation of this poem. This poem is called My Version of Diabolical and hysterical materialism, a poem written for cash. It's an ironic poem, by the way. A poem in which I make fun of certain things, particularly greed. And one might get the impression that I'm celebrating money and the magic of money. Yes, there is an element of truth in there, but it's much more than that, as you, as you hopefully would understand or see. So, the story behind this, I was broke totally broke. There's no magic in my life at that point. There's no magic in my life. I was totally broke in graduate school. I was not in love with anybody at that point. Nor anybody was in love with me. Let me put it that way as well. So it was a, it was a terribly magicless moment in my life. So I used to frequent a bar in Pullman, Washington. So I went to that bar. Even when I didn't have money, I could go to that bar and sit around the table and uh, think about life and uh, absence and presence of magic and so on and so forth. So I did. Go into the bar. And suddenly, sudden, lines started to rush in. I mean, you're, oh my God, I'm getting some lines. Magic. Some kind of magic, I thought. I thought I could write a poem. And I ended up writing one. And then a friend of mine actually showed up as a Native American 
and a graduate student, fellow graduate student, showed up and said, hey, Ashwar, what's going on? And I said, hey, I don't have this money. He don't know what is, I'll buy, buy you a glass of beer, but before that you can have a hamburger if you want, and so on and so forth. So, you know, problems were taken care of, the beginning of some kind of magic, and I ended up writing a poem. And another friend of mine suggested I should share this poem with others. And there was this open mic thing at that bar in the night. So I read this poem. I performed this poem there first. And I ended up earning $50. That wasn't bad at that point. So that was, was you know, some magic. Well, I need your help here. It's a two minute long poem. Your help is simple. You will hear, you will get to hear the word cash repeatedly. It's a refrain in my poem. And when I point at you like this, you also say cash with me. Just cash, cash, cash. Because I want you all to be part of this poem. This will be collective participation. Why not? All right? Can I rely on you for this? Okay, let me rehearse a little bit before I start. Cash. Say, I'm saying cash, 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 and then I'm pointing at it. Say cash, cash. say cash, cash, cash. Say again, cash, 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 cash. Okay, here it goes. When the quibble over the ultimate signified, I say cash. When the shuffle that metaphors are cracking open like an idiot smile, I say cash, say cash, 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 cash. They say love is a divine December or a divine comedy or two bodies are blasted in a single burst of honey or the manuscripts of slokas dazzling like a tiger skin and I say cash loud. Cash, 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 cash. The propose of poetry should be naked or dressed or full or empty or dirty or pure and I say cash is neither prose nor poetry but cash Cash, 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 cash. The measure a distance between a trope and a truth. The seek a sword shift in the garment of the seven stars or fables of incandescent silk in the given blue of midnight, the famous ancient face of the moon revealing itself in the mirror of the sand, the loud laughter of the water and silences of whispering like rains in the hours of love. They say love loves to love love, but I say cash, cash is to cash, cash. They exchange epiphanies and epistemes and late night discourses on Zen. They catch them all, all, all in a flash, but I say cash, say cash this time. Love. Cash, 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 cash. Unpretentious and inevitable like my damn fucking shit and that was it i end it here thank you much for listening you know dr Rasper was saying apart from saying lunch 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 lunch